separating the art from the artist. It's a concept that has widely been debated for years and has become more of a hot button issue in the modern era than ever before. Just typing the phrase into Reddit provides thousands of posts, all discussing how not doing so is childish or how doing so is problematic. There is no clear consensus on the issue, and given how emotional the topic tends to make people, chances are there never will be. But why is that? The term, of course, is reflective of the truth that oftentimes, some of the most profound art and media has been made by monsters, and that if you enjoy that art in the way in which it is meant to be enjoyed, you are directly supporting said monster. Listening to R. Kelly directly puts money into R. Kelly's pocket. Listening to Lost Prophets puts money into Ian Watkins' commissary. Should you then stop listening, watching and enjoying said piece of media, even though the media itself isn't problematic and, in fact, holds personal significance to you? Or should you stop entirely, denouncing the work of someone who has done so much wrong? Some would argue no, you shouldn't stop watching their work, because you can mentally separate the art from the artist and still enjoy what they had previously made without supporting them personally. Although you remain supporting them monetarily, as long as you aren't supportive of the negative things they have done, your conscience can remain as clean as a whistle. Others would argue the opposite. Supporting someone's work at all, especially in ways that they can profit, is inherently problematic. Because it doesn't matter if you have separated the art from the artist, the art supports the artist, and therefore you are supporting them. With the dawn of LimeWire and online pirating, the debate has slightly shifted. Some people now argue that the only ethical way to enjoy a problematic person's art would be to steal it. That way no profits are given to their estate. However, that then lends itself to the discussion of if every person who worked on a project should be likewise penalized for another person's negative actions. Regardless of where you fall in the debate, there is no doubt that the person behind the works that are being so hotly contested are foul, and have admitted to doing some of the worst things imaginable, has led others to feel morally compromised even for enjoying their work. And that certainly is the case today. Welcome back to another episode of Dreading. Today we are going to be covering the case of Roman Polanski. We were asked to cover this case by our subscribers, Nelly Nunia and Travel with Tony. Despite being an incredibly famous case, it appears to be under-scrutinized by the YouTube true crime community. I only state as much, as we have had a very hard time getting this video up in a manner that YouTube would allow, without it being blocked in all territories. In fact, we almost had to make the decision to upload the video on Vimeo because of the content blocks. This video, like the majority of ours, has been copyright claimed by a third party and demonetized, meaning that we don't control if there are any ads placed on the video, as we are not allowed to profit from it. This is true of the vast majority of our backlog, which is why we created a Patreon. If you would like to support our content and help us make more, please consider supporting us over there. A link will be placed in the description box down below. If you like this video, feel free to subscribe, like, and share. With all that said, let us begin. Roman Polanski was born August 18, 1933 in Paris, France, to Beulah and Moises Leibling. Moises was a Polish artist who favored paint and sculpture, and his mother was a Russian woman who had traveled to Paris when she was young. When Roman was just four, his father moved the family to Poland in order to be closer to his own extended family. Two years after the move, at the start of World War II, Germany would go on to invade Poland, and the majority of his family would be taken to ghettos, as they were partially Jewish. His family was originally sent to the Krakow ghetto together. However, they didn't stay united for long. After a short amount of time, his mother would be sent to Auschwitz, and die shortly after arriving. Meanwhile, his father was sent to Mauthausen in Austria. At the age of six, Roman witnessed the horrors of war, and was forced to watch people being murdered nearly every day. In one instance, he recalled watching a German soldier shoot an elderly woman in the head for not being able to walk fast enough, and being used for target practice by other soldiers on the way to school. A Roman Catholic woman had promised his father that she would look after Roman when he was taken away, and she was able to help Roman escape the Krakow ghetto. However, he wasn't able to appropriately blend in with her family, which caused her a fair amount of grief for both Roman and them, as they feared they would be killed for harboring him. Due to their fear, Roman would be shuttled between multiple different families, all of which tried their best to protect him, but ultimately didn't want to risk their own lives. On more than one occasion, Roman recalled being quizzed by different members of a local church to make sure he fit into the families he was staying with, but couldn't properly recall a certain Catholic prayer. He was then told that he quote-unquote wasn't one of them. 
and was left on his own at just 11 years of age. When the war was finally over, Roman was 12, and he was able to be reunited with his father, who changed his name to Rysard Polanski. To cope with the atrocities that he had lived through and witnessed, Roman turned to cinema, which had been a burgeoning field. For him, movies encapsulated the fantastical part of life, and it was the truest form of escapism. He had gone through the most horrific atrocities known to man, and being able to escape, even for 30 minutes, was a treat for him. In his own autobiography, Roman by Polanski, he summarizes his thoughts as follows. Movies were becoming an absolute obsession with me. I was enthralled by everything connected to the cinema, not just the movies themselves, but the aura that surrounded them. I loved the luminous rectangle of the screen, the sight of the beam slicing through the darkness from the projection booth, the miraculous synchronization of sound and vision, even the dusty smell of the tip-up seats. More than anything else, though, I was fascinated by the actual mechanics of the process. Because of his passion for all things cinema, Roman decided that he would pursue a career in the arts. He had originally been motivated to be an actor, and while attending the National Film School in Lotz, Poland, starred in three movies, Pokoleni, Saxaroni Rower, and Rower. The third film, Rower, was his directorial debut, as it was based on a real-life event from his childhood. However, when he originally decided to make the film, he had only taken up directing so he could star in it, with the idea that no one else would be able to deliver on his vision. But from the moment he stepped behind the camera, he knew he had found his calling. Something about directing spoke to him above everything else that he knew. He had spent his first few years of his life in total chaos. He had to fend for himself during the war, watch his friends and family perish in front of his eyes, and throughout all of it, he lacked any semblance of control. Even how he had to appear to others was constantly under scrutiny, and one wrong action could result in his death. But being in film school, being behind a camera and yelling directions that his wards would then have to follow to keep their jobs, thrilled him. And it was that thrill and sense of power that led him to pursuing directing full-time. Immediately, Roman found directorial success. His films began to get recognized outside of his schooling, and when he graduated in 1959, he had the entire world ahead of him. He quickly fell into a groove, making movies to wide acclaim. His first movie, A Knife in the Water, which came out in 1962, gave him his first Academy Award nomination for Best Foreign Language Film. He followed it up with a small number of short films, one of which led him to meeting his first wife, Barbara Kwiatkowska Lass. The pair had met in 1959, and in the span of two short years, were both married and divorced. Although Barbara made it a point to not comment on their marriage prior to her death in 1995, it was widely known that despite being married, Polanski enjoyed the company of other women, most of which were much younger than himself. Though he wasn't necessarily famous yet, because of his directing, he was constantly surrounded by young girls who were interested in becoming a star. Models and young actresses would be brought to set, and they would be forced to follow his direction and do what he said. He was the top dog in the production, and he had the power to take a background actor and give them the spotlight. All they would have to do was whatever he wanted, and he was not shy about wielding that power. Fidelity was not something he cared for, and that was so commonly known that most who knew Polanski would joke about his wandering eyes. Following his divorce in 1965, he made Repulsion, his first psychological horror film. A year after, made Cul-de-sac, and directly following that, created The Fearless Vampire Killers, where he met his late wife, Sharon Tate. In order to properly surmise and speak about Roman Polanski, we have to make a pit stop and talk about Sharon Tate, his second wife, and how she was horrifically murdered in one of the most gruesome cult killings ever to occur. Unfortunately, Sharon's life and the beautiful things she did in it is often dwarfed by both her manner of death and the crimes of her husband, but she is so much more than that. It also doesn't help that the media depictions of her after her passing ultimately mischaracterize her to sensationalize her untimely death. Sharon was a beautiful woman, but more than that, she was excessively kind, a trait that stemmed from the fact that her family traveled throughout her childhood. Sharon always had a hard time making friends, given that it felt as if the ground was always moving under her feet, and she could never truly settle. In order to compensate, she was always incredibly kind and caring, often spending time with other people who she felt as lonely as she did. It seemed that misfits were attracted to her, 
and she provided people with a level of care that they wouldn't get anywhere else. Though her beauty brought people to her, her loving nature kept them there. Sharon's rise to stardom wasn't something that she had planned, or even something she really wanted. Instead, it just kind of happened to her because of her unique beauty and her effortless style. While her family was living in Italy, Sharon and a group of friends decided to respond to an ad for film extras in the area. The teens thought it would be funny to be in the background of a real movie, but when they arrived, one of the stars, Richard Beimer, took notice of Sharon right away. He walked over and introduced himself himself, and the two quickly started dating. From then on, when he had a job, she would often appear in a smaller role as well. These small acting roles led to her getting an agent, and then going out for movies. She had originally planned to be a psychiatrist, but somehow ended up being an incredibly popular model and actress. After years of taking on projects and working in the industry, Sharon met Roman on the set of Fearless Vampire Killers, and the pair fell in love. Sharon spoke of how they met, and how originally, she was under the impression that Roman didn't actually like her. He had wanted another actress to play the role she was ultimately given. And in the first weeks of filming, he was extraordinarily hard on her. He treated her worse than everyone else on set, and in one instance, he had her do one take 70 times, yelling at her that she couldn't do it right. That day, she overheard him talking about how what a mistake it was that they casted her. And from then on, she swore she would get him to like her. Roman wasn't only directing the movie, he was also the lead actor, playing Sharon's love interest. As time went on, According to Roman, he began to see her talent and fell in love with her. The pair quickly got together, but still, Roman made sure to inform Tate that he had no plans to stop sleeping with any of the young girls that he fancied on set. Early on in the relationship, Sharon told Roman that she understood and had no qualms about him sleeping with other people. But as the relationship got more serious, she had hoped he would eventually stop. In response to Sharon's unhappiness about his infidelity, Roman would angrily remind her that she had promised she wasn't going to change him, and that she was just like his petty ex-wife. He referred to her not wanting him to cheat as Sharon's big hang-up, and constantly talked down to her because of it. In an interview with former friend Peter Evans, he stated that in a private moment, Sharon had opened up to him, saying that she and Roman had a good arrangement. Roman lies to me, and I pretend to believe him. At the end of 1968, Tate became pregnant with Polanski's child, and the pair moved into 10050 Silo Drive in Benedict Canyon, Los Angeles. It was there that the pregnant Tate and her friends Jay Sebring, Wycheck Frykowski, and Abigail Folger were brutally murdered by the Manson family cult. Polanski had been out of the country working on a movie, but returned to the USA when he heard about the horror that had taken place in his home. Polanski would go on to describe Sharon's murder and the death of his unborn child to be a true watershed moment in his life. In his autobiography, he claimed that this moment changed him from a boundlessly joyful, effervescent optimist to a weathering pessimist who only saw the worst in people. But how true of his initial claim of being remains to be seen, as he was often described as cruel and callous even towards people he loved. Even Sharon herself had stated that his dry sense of humor often bordered on hurtful, and he had been careless with others' feelings for as long as she knew him. Regardless of if he had ever been extremely positive or a loving person, he had self-admittedly turned cold after Sharon's brutal murder. According to his biography, though, he spent the majority of time mourning the loss of Sharon with multiple young girls between the ages of 16 to 19, who, according to him, felt the need to make love to him. Years after his wife's death, Polanski returned to filmmaking with his own adaptation of Macbeth, which was funded primarily by Hugh Hefner in Playboy Productions. Macbeth was followed shortly thereafter with his absurdist comedy, What? And then Chinatown. Chinatown was a smash hit and was nominated for 11 Academy Awards and was selected by the Library of Congress for preservation, as it was considered culturally historic and aesthetically significant. This movie single-handedly turned Polanski into one of the most sought-after and revered directors of all time. Even now, Film aficionados praise Chinatown as an incredible film and celebrate Polanski as a true visionary for creating it. It was under this extreme amount of fame and reverence when Roman would meet 13-year-old Samantha Jane Gailey. Before we continue, this portion of the video goes over the night in which Roman Polanski sexually assaulted a 13-year-old girl. If this is not something that you are mentally capable of taking on, feel free to exit the video now or skip to a later part. 
Those parts will still acknowledge the crime, albeit with less detail. If this is something you are not currently able to handle, have a good day and please stay safe. With that being said, let us continue. The following is Samantha's account of what occurred that night, according to the transcripts from her trial and her book, The Girl, as well as a number of interviews she has done throughout the years. The year was 1976, and Polanski had been offered a small photography job with French Vogue. Self-admittedly, Roman believed that this job was given to him so he could further explore his lust towards young girls, as it was quite commonly known in the industry. The assignment was to shoot these young teen girls as they really were, and according to his autobiography, how they really were was, quote-unquote, sexy, pert, and thoroughly human. Polanski had been looking for more girls to photograph when he was introduced to Gailey, then just 13 years old, by her sister's boyfriend. Samantha had been characterized by being somewhat of a Lolita, who wanted more than anything to be famous, and was willing to do anything to get there. However, it would be much more accurate to state that she wanted to be famous in the way most young teens want to be famous. The idea of having any sort of celebrity traveling around the world and living amongst the stars intrigued her, but in a very vague, uncomplicated way, because she was a child. After meeting Samantha, Polanski immediately declared she would be perfect for the photo shoot. For their first shoot together, Polanski had Gailey alone, stating that he wanted her to behave as naturally as possible in the photos, as that was his assignment. After a couple of test photos, he asked her to take off her top, and she, being 13 years old and in the company of an adult man, who she believed was a professional, who wasn't looking to abuse his power over her, did as she was told. Polanski continued to take photos of her topless, as well as photos of her getting changed after. In his autobiography, which once again was written after he had been charged for his crimes, he went further to state that she had, quote, nice breasts. Gailey, in her own book, stated that she was so young at the time, she hadn't even begun wearing bras, as she was, according to her, built like a child. After their first photo shoot, Gailey didn't necessarily feel as if anything had been amiss. She hadn't realized that she never needed to be undressed or that the photos he had taken were inappropriate in the slightest. Instead, she believed that she had been lucky enough to be chosen to model for an incredibly famous director, and that this would in turn be her big break. Months after the initial photo shoot, on March 10th, Polanski contacted her once more and stated that they needed to finish the shoot. Her mom agreed to have Polanski pick her up, and took her to Jack Nicholson and Angelica Houston's home. Originally, Sam had planned to ask Polanski if one of her friends could come along for the shoot, if not to be a part of it, then just to watch. But when Polanski arrived at her home to pick her up, he rushed her into the car, stating that they needed to hurry as they were quote-unquote losing the light for the day. Roman and Sam shot five minutes away from the home for about an hour, utilizing the natural light on a hill near the home. However, as Roman predicted, the sun had gotten too low in the sky, and they could no longer comfortably shoot. He then called down to the house and asked if he could finish the shoot there, which Angelica agreed to. When the pair made it to the home, Angelica and Roman stood talking as Sam looked around, awestruck by the house. She then informed Roman that she was kind of thirsty, and he went to the fridge and pulled out a bottle of champagne. He looked at Sam and asked her if he could open it, playfully, and she, wanting to seem more adult and cool to the two celebrities she was with, said she didn't care. He poured three glasses, one for himself, Angelica, and the child, and they drank. After Angelica had drunk half of her glass of champagne, she excused herself and left the home, stating she needed to go to work. Roman and Sam then restarted their photo shoot, and Roman had her pose with the alcohol. He continued to refill it for each shot, and encouraged her to continue to drink for the photos. He brought her outside to the patio, and continued to shoot her until he decided that she needed to, once again, take her top off. And Sam, still trusting that he wasn't using his position over her inappropriately, did as she was told. After posing for some time topless, he told her that she needed to call her mother, as he would likely be keeping her late into the night. When he had left the room to find a phone, Sam got redressed, choosing to change into a dress she had brought with her. When he returned with the phone, he emphasized that this was all above board, and that he had simply lost track of time prior to picking her up. So when she called her mother, she told her the same. Shortly after speaking with her mother, Roman told her that he wanted to show her the jacuzzi that Jack had recently gotten. But before he brought her outside, he coaxed her into the bathroom and showed her a pill that had been split into three parts. He asked her if she knew if it was a quaalude, and she said she did. He then bashfully tried to play dumb and asked her if she thought he would be able to drive her home if he took it. She, being a 13-year-old fucking child, 
stated that she didn't know. He then asked her if she thought he should take it, and once again, she said she didn't know. He then said he would and asked her if she wanted a part of it, which she then said no. His response seemed to shake her a bit, and according to the grand jury testimony she gave, she said that directly after he responded, she then changed her mind and said she would take it. Again, it's important to emphasize the power that Roman had over Sam at this point. She had been drinking nonstop since entering the home, with Roman consistently plying her with alcohol. He had made her feel cool and special, and was treating her like an equal, despite the fact that he was in his 40s. Her saying that she didn't want to take the pill that he was offering had resulted in such a radical tone shift from him that she immediately felt as if she had done something wrong. Her simple no changed his entire demeanor and caused her to feel as if she were in the wrong in some way. And, being that she was drunk and desperate to please him, she changed her mind and stated that she would take the other part of the pill. After taking the quaalude he had offered her, Roman brought her outside and then told her that he wanted to get some photos of her in the jacuzzi. He told Samantha to take off her clothes and get in. She wanted to wear her underwear, but he told her it would be better if she was just naked. Sam, who at this point was 13, high, and drunk, did as she was told. Roman took her picture outside of the jacuzzi as she stood in it, and then declaring that there was not enough natural light, stated that he was going to get in himself so they could just hang out. He went inside and put his camera down then returned shortly after completely naked. It was then, and only then, that Sam began to feel uncomfortable. Before this point, she had felt that any uncomfortable notion she had was just part of the job. Even if he was asking her to take her shirt off and get naked, it was because he was the photographer, and it was strictly professional. But without the camera as a barrier, she began to realize that Roman's actions might not be entirely wholesome. When Roman entered the jacuzzi, he went into the deepest part of it, and called her over. Sam refused, and instead went to the other side and stated that she needed to get out. Roman continued to insist that she go over to him, that she needed to see something over where he was, but Sam continued to say no, and told Roman that she was having trouble breathing. Not wanting to insult him by outright rejecting his advance, but realizing that the situation had escalated in a way that she was no longer comfortable with, Sam told Roman that her asthma was acting up, despite the fact that she didn't actually have asthma. She went on to state that because of the warm water and the cold air, it was negatively affecting her ability to breathe, so she needed to get out of the jacuzzi full stop. But Roman insisted, telling her that she could go, she just needed to feel something over where he was first. Finally, she relented and went over to where he was. Roman placed his hands on her sides and held her up, as if she was too short to be in the deepest part of the jacuzzi. He then hovered her over the jacuzzi's jets and asked her if it felt good down there. Still wanting to leave, she said it did, but she needed to get out. Roman tried to keep her in, but she eventually was able to get out of the jacuzzi and cover herself up with the towel. Instead of noticing that the child he was alone with was feeling uncomfortable and wanted to leave, Roman instead went into the attached pool. He was still naked and insisted that Sam should get in as well. She held firm, stating it would be bad for her health to do so, and instead went back inside to the bathroom to dry herself off and get dressed. As she began to get redressed, Roman came into the bathroom and asked her if her asthma was bad and if she was alright. Sam said she wasn't and that she wanted to go home in order to take her medicine. Roman told her that he would take her home soon, and when she insisted that she should be taken home immediately, he told her that she needed to go into the other room and lie down. She continued to state that she wanted to go home, but Roman refused to listen, instead telling her that she needed to go into the other room and lie down on the bed. At this point, Sam was afraid. She knew now that he wanted her to do something that she wasn't comfortable with, and what felt like hours of back and forth, Sam realized he wasn't going to listen to her. She sat on the couch in the other room, and Roman sat down next to her and once again asked her if she was okay. She said she wasn't, but he told her that she'll be better soon. He then kissed her, and once again, she told him no and to stop. She repeated that she wanted to go home, but as he kissed her, he told her he would take her home soon. The entire grand jury testimony is publicly available and goes over how Roman assaulted Sam, but nothing is as telling as the fact that she was so young and she didn't know what cunnilingus was, but had heard law enforcement classify what he had done to her as such, and when asked what he had done on the stand, said he performed cuddliness on her. Roman spent the next hour sexually assaulting Sam in every possible way. 
She had consistently told him no and to stop, but upon realizing that she was overpowered and had no way of leaving his home without his help, she knew that she wouldn't be able to stop him. However, after a short while, Angelica Houston had come back to the home. She knocked on the door of the room that Roman was assaulting Samantha in and called in asking what he was doing. Roman stopped the attack and opened the door and talked to Angelica, letting her know that he was just inside getting dressed. It was unclear if Angelica was aware that Sam was still in the home or not. Sam tried to use the distraction to get dressed, and hoped Angelica's presence was enough to end the assault. However, Roman wasn't done. After speaking with Angelica for less than a minute, he shut the door and grabbed Sam, who had been able to put on her underwear. He then started to assault her once more, and finished quickly after. When he had finished and let go of her again, Sam took the opportunity she had and left, quickly putting on her clothes and rushing out of the front door. Before she was able to leave, she ran into Angelica in the living room of the house, said hi, and then continued to Roman's car. Once inside the car, she broke down crying. Roman, for his part, got dressed and then came outside, only to tell Sam that he was going to talk to Angelica for a bit and would be out in a short while. When he finally did come back to the car, seeing that she had been crying, Roman told Sam that what had happened should be their little secret, and that she shouldn't talk about what they had done with anyone else. For Roman, this was set to be just another night, not unlike nights he had had before. But for Samantha, what had occurred was anything but normal. When Sam got home that night, she immediately called her boyfriend to talk about what had happened. She was upset for countless reasons, but amongst those was the fact that she felt that she had been unfaithful to her boyfriend at the time. As she spoke to him on the phone and went over how Roman had given her alcohol and drugs and assaulted her, her mother overheard and immediately called the police. From there, Sam gave her testimony about what had happened that night with Polanski and was likewise arrested the next night and charged with six offenses. Unlawful sexual intercourse with a minor, rape by using drugs, perversion, sodomy, lewd and lascivious acts upon a child under 14, and furnishing a controlled substance to a minor. In her testimony, Sam was honest in the fact that she had, on a previous occasion, taken a quaalude on her own when she was younger, because she had been curious as to what the pill was. She also stated that she had sex twice before with her boyfriend, who was likewise a minor, but in those times had given consent. And while we, in 2022, understand that that doesn't invalidate what Roman did to her, the press, and Roman himself, had a field day with those facts. They characterized Sam as a heartless, sexually experienced deviant, who had plotted with her mother to take Roman down. They stated that she had been the one in control of the entire situation, despite being 13 years old. Drunk and high by Roman's own design and admission. Unlike so many cases where a famous individual is accused of a crime, as heinous as assaulting a minor, Roman never actually denied that he had sex with Samantha. In fact, he was incredibly open with the public, stating that he did supply her with alcohol and quaaludes and had sex with the 13-year-old girl. But she had consented. To him, it was obvious that she wanted to sleep with him, and the only reason the police were involved in the case was because he was famous. In fact, in his own book, he went on to say that the night had been filled with a lot of erotic tension so much that it had been palpable to him, and that despite her faking an asthma attack to get away from him, she was very much into what he had done. He hotly contested that the mother had put her up to making the police report against him, while acknowledging that no part of the police report was actually false or inaccurate to what he had done. But he stated that because she had said prior that she had had sex before, there was no way what he did could have been considered to be assault. So in Roman's mind, if you have ever had sex before, you simply can't be assaulted. And if you have ever consented to anyone, you have consented to him. Roman denied the claims outright, pleading not guilty, despite also admitting that he had in fact done what he was being accused of. Many executives in Hollywood, likewise, came to his defense stating that what he did wasn't that big of a deal, and he was a good man. The backlash towards Sam, who everyone agreed had been sexually exploited by Roman, was great. And in order to lessen the blowback, her lawyer, Lawrence Silver, offered Polanski a plea deal, and Polanski eagerly took it. The plea deal that was offered to Roman was as follows. He would plead guilty to felony statutory rape, and likewise, the other charges would be dropped entirely. 
This would allow for a much lighter sentence to be handed down to Polanski, who the media was labeling as both a martyr and a sexual deviant. Before he was sentenced in court, the judge placed on the case, Lawrence J. Rittenband, invited Polanski's lawyer and the district attorney trying the case to his office for an off-the-record meeting. In this meeting, according to Polanski's lawyer and later confirmed by the district attorney, Robert Gunson, written band told them how he planned on sentencing Polanski. According to both men present, he wanted to send Polanski to state prison, only on probation, for a mental health evaluation. The evaluation would last no more than 90 days, and in fact could be as short as 30 days, if the evaluation came back without any signs of deviancy or other mental issues that would need to be addressed. He would then release Polanski, stating that the up to 90 days was a fair response to Polanski drugging and assaulting a child. Written band then had the two lawyers agree to present this plan as their own when they officially sentenced him three days later. However, Dalton wanted to add one stipulation to that agreement. He asked the judge in court if it would be acceptable that Roman could fly overseas in order to finish shooting the movie he had been working on before reporting to prison. Written band agreed, and it was set that 90 days later, Roman would report to a state prison for his mental health evaluation. After the sentencing, Roman flew out to finish filming the movie he was purported to be working on, Hurricane. However, only 10 days after the plea agreement was set in motion, Roman made a pit stop in Germany to take part in the celebration of Oktoberfest. Immediately, photos of Roman with his arms around young girls drinking beers and smoking cigars were in the media. This image of Roman immediately caused an uproar. To the people who already thought that a 90-day mental health evaluation was a light sentence for knowingly drugging and assaulting a minor, this was just a slap in the face. The idea that Roman was being given special treatment because of his fame, and that you could get away with any crime in LA as long as you had the money and power, became a common conversation topic. The DA thought that Roman's flagrant disregard for the sentence, as well as his nonchalant attitude was disrespectful, but no one was more annoyed by the photos as Judge Rittenband. According to those around him, he had loved the media attention that he had gained during the trial. People that appreciated his candor, and while it felt like the sentence was light, they ultimately agreed that he had done a good job with it. However, after the photos were put into the press, and the tide of public opinion began to change, he felt disrespected by Polanski. Rittenband allegedly told gossip columnist and friend Marilyn Beck that he was furious about the photos. He was quoted as stating, I had been told that 400 employees were waiting for Polanski to work on the film, and I believed it. Though I don't want to prejudge the case, it does appear that I may have been innocently deceived. He had been so angry, he wanted to order Polanski to immediately return to the U.S. He argued that the photo was enough evidence to show that he was not, in fact, using his time abroad to work. However, written band eventually allowed Polanski to stay in Europe for the remainder of the agreed-upon time, refusing the defense's request to allow him to stay in Europe any more than 90 days. Roman then returned to the U.S. and reported to the Chino State Prison in California for his mental health evaluation on December 18, 1977. He was then released 42 days later. His defensive counsel, probation officer, and psychiatrist all recommended that he be sentenced to time served and be given probation, as it had been agreed upon earlier. Two psychiatrists who had seen him stated that he was not, in fact, a pedophile or a sexual deviant, and the chances of him reoffending were slim, despite the fact that he would go on to state multiple times throughout his life, and even in his own biography, that he enjoyed having sex with minors, and that something like this had been bound to happen to him. However, Rittenband had other plans. He had felt completely disrespectful by Polanski's actions, his brazen partying with other young girls in Germany, and his continued nonchalantness made the court look stupid, and he didn't want to appear as a lenient judge who had been bought. Once again, he invited the district attorney and Polanski's lawyer into his chambers and spoke to them about what he planned to do. He told them that the 42-day sentence was not enough for the crimes that Polanski had committed, and he was determined, at the very least, to sentence him to an additional 48 days in prison. At the very least, he wanted Polanski to serve 90 days. He then added that he planned on deporting Polanski out of the country for his crimes, as he had never gotten a green card. He then added that he was considering sentencing Polanski to 50 years in prison. According to a screenwriter friend of Polanski, 
he stated the written band had likewise said publicly that he planned on making sure that Roman never saw the light of day again. Shortly after this meeting, Polanski's attorney met up with Roman and informed him that the judge had changed his mind. According to Polanski himself, his lawyer told him that the judge could, quote-unquote, no longer be trusted, and that he was going to be forced back into prison for the rest of his days. Polanski then decided that he would have to flee his home to France. Because of the laws regarding extradition, Roman was allowed to stay in France without fear of being sent back to prison or America. It was there that he would continue to work and make movies. The following is an interview that Roman did with Clive Jones in 1983. The full interview can be found on YouTube. Something to note before starting is the fact that Roman has no shame in discussing what he did, how he did it, or why. He steadily admits to the sexual assault, but he shamelessly tries to push any negative connotation onto Sam, classifying her as the sexual aggressor who only spoke out because he is famous. Many people in the comment section of the full interview have gone on to state that he is so charming and charismatic that what he says makes a lot of sense. Even though what he's saying is that a 13-year-old can consent to sleeping with a 44-year-old man, and it shouldn't matter. Anyway, that's, that's fiction. And I think this probably uh, may be still in the land of fiction, edging towards fact. When the, when the newspapers and the magazines and the books talk about you and little girls, is there anything in it? Well, I, I like young women, let's put it this way. I think most of men do, actually. Yeah, but the question, the question turns on how young, doesn't it? Well, yes, well, here you come to a, to a concrete uh, um, case for which I have been <clears throat> uh, behind the bars, and that's what you want to talk about it. I'm and glad you left it for, 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 for coffee, you know, <laughs> for the coffee. Uh, but uh, what exactly would you like me to tell you? Uh, I, w I want you to know what happened that night. But you want the, 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 the nitty-gritty there. No, I don't, want the nitty -gritty. I don't want the nitty-gritty. That was the last thing I want. It wasn't night. It was an afternoon. No. It was... Uh, um, I was about to make um, um, a series of photographs of uh, young girls of uh, that age for a um, um, uh, uh, French magazine call, called Vogue Homme. And uh, I found it quite an interesting um, enterprise because I like the girls of this age and uh, because the girls of that age for some reason like me. Here, where he says that girls of that age, meaning 13 years old, seem to like him. He is trying to downplay what any interaction between what he, a powerful Hollywood director, and a 13-year-old would be. There is no casual interaction that could happen between these two sets of people. Most of the girls he would meet would be auditioning or working for him in some sense, meaning he had a significant amount of power over them, akin to a boss. Using logical reasoning, is it not then normal for you to be kind towards your boss, instead of standoffish? Now imagine your boss is one of the most revered men in Hollywood, and you are a young girl who wants to be famous. You are not going to treat that person poorly. Him trying to downplay that interaction of general professional kindness that young girls would naturally be displaying as them showing real romantic or sexual interest is his way of softening the idea of him taking advantage of children. Uh, and just it went a little bit too far, one of those uh, on, on, on the session with this girl. And um, uh, it happened one afternoon when I was, uh, after I photographed her. Um, the next day, or two, no, day after, I was uh, uh, stopped uh, at the lobby of the hotel where I was staying in Los Angeles by a, uh, a man who identified himself as a um, Los Angeles policeman. Uh, I was then booked, and the proceedings started. Um, after almost a year of um, tremendous uh, struggle and hardship, as you can probably imagine, and you may remember of being on every page of every possible newspaper and magazine, eventually the judge who uh, uh, was in charge of the case 
<coughs> decided to send me to a, 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 a prison in California for so-called um, psychiatric evaluation. So I went to a Chino prison and uh, the judge uh, told the, uh, my lawyer and the district attorney that he hopes that that report will be positive and uh, that I will get the probation. And it was, wasn't it? You came out it after was, 42 days with a positive... It was very positive, and then he called it a whitewash. So he found some other uh, provision under which he could put me back and then decide when I will, will be released. And at that time, I thought there was no more point of endure it. And I uh, uh, just left, as you know. That was quite a splash. Granted that you have this interest in, in young girls, and it never concealed, really, in fact, you have an interesting young girl. Wasn't an incident like the one that happened more or less bound to happen eventually? Well, looking back at it, it probably uh, was bound to happen, yes. Polanski just literally stated that his assault and rape of a child was bound to happen, and that a young girl stating that he had assaulted them was inevitable. And yet, there are still celebrities in Hollywood, to this day, defending and working with this man. What's even more alarming is the fact that he is so brazen with his attraction to minors, so open about how he had done this before, but two psychiatrists were willing to say in court that he was not a danger to minors, and likewise, not a predator. It was bound to happen. Um, <clears throat> although, on my part, it was <clears throat> uh, done with all innocence. Uh, there is no way to have sex with a 13-year-old after you have supplied them with alcohol and drugs and refuse to take them home that can be classified as innocent. That is something that is simply not real. I have to point out that the girl <clears throat> uh, has had um, testified before the grand jury to uh, previous <clears throat> sexual experiences. Uh, she told me how far back it was. I, it's no point of talking about it, but there is a fact that there were other men in her life and uh, that nobody else had the same problems that I had, which means that, uh, again, as you said, my profiles may be such that attracts more attention. Of, you know, if it was... Uh, somebody absolutely unknown to the press or to, to the public, he may have not had the same problems. Polanski, as previously stated, really tried to drive home the idea that because Samantha had had sex previously, it was then impossible for him to have raped her, as if one sexual experience is indicative of another. That is patently untrue and he tries to utilize this piece of information to discredit her as a fame-seeking Lolita who purposely seduced him in order to accuse him of said crime. What's imperative to note is that he outwardly admitted to everything that she claimed. He admitted to being sexually attracted to minors, he stated that he did have sex with her, and that he did, in his words, take it too far. So her not being a virgin should have absolutely no bearing on the rest of the conversation or how people proceed. It's akin to someone rear-ending your car, then stating because you had been rear-ended in the past, it didn't matter if they did it now. Most of people in the state of California are guilty of the similar crime since the age of consent in that state is 18. Yeah. And it's very difficult to find someone who did not have a sexual experience uh, uh, before reaching this age. What Roman fails to understand is that minors can consent to having sex with their peers and people of similar ages, and that not everyone feels the same way he does about children. Him stating that everyone in California is likewise guilty of sleeping with a child is patently untrue, but it goes unchallenged, and he's allowed to continue. So uh, that means that uh, there are a lot of law bro uh, breakers. Well, with me, it was a bit more extreme, of course, because the girl was uh, two weeks short of 14. But if you have mm -hmm. seen her uh, sitting here next to me, you wouldn't be particularly shocked by it. As a matter of fact, you would find it completely normal. Roman once again tries to infer that Samantha, a 13-year-old, was an independently sexual being. 
and that any man who saw her would see her that way. This is him once again trying to discredit her story by pinning the blame on her. He is trying to imply that what he did was natural and shouldn't be considered a crime, while also acknowledging that she is a child. Particularly concerned to find out how old she was. And you actually did know. You actually did yeah, know. Yeah, I knew, I knew. I knew she was 14 because she was talking about her birthday before that. Doesn't the age of consent mean precisely that? That under a certain age, whatever age it may be, it doesn't matter if the girl says yes or not or wants to or not. That you're supposed not to because it's. Yes, I know. I know. In that particular state. That's a, a, again no, the question of. You know, <clears throat> everywhere in the West has got some sort of age. No, consent. but you see, if you, if you think of the United States, there are st the states when the age of consent is 12 in the United States. So you see, and there are other countries where, you know, it varies from country to, uh, country, to country. Yes, indeed, you know, that's, uh, well, uh, it's very easy to say it now when you should have thought about it before. But if you find yourself with a girl in a certain situation, you don't exactly think of it here again i mean the press and i i can see there's a there's a an element of victimization in what the press did after after that incident but even then you know, the press has the press has got a lot to work on if they want to make life impossible for you in california and try and influence the court and uh, you, you if you're self-confessedly interested in young girls or you get yourself photographed with them which you did which which ha actually happened mm -hmm. after the Okay, so I mean, if you went back, wouldn't you be just within, cruci wouldn't you within just be the crucified? limits of the law? Of course, after that, you know, I'm be, I'm very careful now. Right, but yeah, I'm, I'm talking. If it came to court, what do you call young girls? I mean, everybody well, else goes you, with tell, young tell, girls. Go to any nightclub, restaurant, I'll, you will see. I'll tell you what the, I mean by the age girls. difference. What do you mean young girls? Because age is age is everything. You mean children, or you mean young age, girls? Age is everything. So because the law is about age. Here he asks, "Do you mean children, or do you mean young girls?" To him, he tries to imply that there is a noticeable and obvious difference. Sam was so young, she hadn't even begun wearing bras. The girls he was interested in were children. He just doesn't want to admit that. What about maturity or wisdom or future stardom? Now, I'm talking yeah, like... but in France it's 15, Okay, so, so it's in France that you, Nastasia Kinski becomes your next star, right? She's 15 years old, and the world, one way or another, finds out you're having an affair with her. Now, the, the fact that you're having an affair that with a 15 year old... That was before, before. Yeah. She that, was 15 before. But that can get you 50 years in California. Yeah. Yeah, no, so, but not here. No, but if you're... Not the, in if Germany. The, if the case... Just to be clear, they are discussing another young girl who he had slept with when she was 15 and he was in his 40s. Roman tries to deflect by saying that it's legal in Germany, so it shouldn't matter. It comes to trial in California. All these things are going to... No, I can't get it 50 years. I mean, this is, this is the, the nonsense that press writes about. What, 50 years? Just think. Come on, there were, in uh, that year, there were 20 or 19 cases in California itself of similar, uh, of similar nature. Nobody went to prison or only... I th uh, there were policemen and, and uh, uh, people in public service involved were, in the cases. You were I did, because, the, you know, the, it was focused on me. Not that the press it's particularly nasty to me they just try to make the, make the buck the lunch is getting into a dinner now and i just want to uh, in case if you have in mind finishing this interview i wanted to ask you whether you intend to end on this note or do you think there's something more to my life than my relations with uh, young women i uh, think there's a lot more to your life otherwise i wouldn't be talking to you and uh Certainly going to not going to end in this note, but it's a note that had to be struck. Yes, I don't blame you for it. Of course, I was waiting for it. It's a note know, that's I, 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 I admire your your courtesy of uh, leaving it for cough for the coffee. If it had come with the foie gras, <laughs> I would have screwed the whole thing. Oh yes, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> In this interview, Roman has, in quick succession, blamed young girls for him being attracted to them, stated that what he did to Sam wasn't that bad because she wasn't a virgin and that likewise he shouldn't have to go to jail at all because she wanted it. And still, despite admitting to everything, pleading guilty, and stating that he had no intentions to stop sleeping with minors, people continued to work with him. After Roman fled the United States, he continued to make movies, and while one would think that his career would somehow suffer because he is an admitted child rapist, it didn't. In fact, he would go on to be idolized and revered even more fervently. After the assault, he went on to make Tess, Pirates, Frantic, Bitter Moon, Death and the Maiden, The Ninth Gate, The Pianist, Oliver Twist, The Ghost Rider, Carnage, Venus and Fur, 
based on a true story, and most recently, An Officer and a Spy. Likewise, he won awards for Pirates, The Pianist, and Carnage, cementing his position as one of the most decorated filmmakers. But in 2009, he was jailed for two months while in Switzerland. The United States wanted to extradite him back so he could be sentenced for the assault he had done on Samantha. Although by that time, she was no longer interested. Instead, she wanted to be left alone. During the two-month period in which he was kept under house arrest, Harvey Weinstein created a petition that was signed by hundreds of celebrities and elites who wanted Polanski to be pardoned for his crimes. They argued that enough time had passed and he was a good person. Harvey went on to state that he was calling on every filmmaker who could help fix this terrible situation. It makes sense that Harvey would be someone who would defend him. Two months after being arrested, he was released from custody and allowed to leave Switzerland unencumbered, without facing deportation. One common misconception about this case is that Samantha is the only person to ever accuse Roman of assault, which is patently untrue. However, most only point to her story, as it was the most publicized. Likewise, it should also be stated that Samantha no longer holds any hostility towards Roman, and in fact believes he's a good guy who made a mistake, but ultimately didn't mean to hurt her. In her own words, he had been arrogant and horny, but wanted her to feel good and thought nothing more of what he did. She similarly believes that Judge Rittenband was more concerned with his fame and being part of such a media circus than following through with his oath to provide justice for her. She has done various interviews in the past 20 years defending Roman, and has even gone so far as to state that they have a sort of kinship with each other based upon how maligned they both were in the press, which is odd given that Roman was the only one maligning her. According to Roman himself in the interview we already went over, Something like this was, quote, bound to happen to him because of his proclivity towards young girls. In his book, he boasted about his love of having sex with underage girls, as they had a natural beauty to them that they would lose with age. He even claimed to be borderline powerless around teenagers and painted them as sexual aggressors towards him. He had worked as a director and photographer of young women for years and was not shy about using that power to get them into bed. So much so that even when he was married to Sharon Tate, people would joke about it. Though Samantha was the only person to come forward at the time, it was really only a matter of time before other women would come forward with their stories. Other young girls who had gone through the same thing as Samantha were ultimately swayed into silence by how she had been treated when they came forward. The media was not kind to her, and other women who were likewise assaulted took note and chose to say nothing. In 2010, actress Charlotte Lewis, who had worked with Polanski on the 1986 film Pirates, stated that he had assaulted her when she had auditioned for him when she was 16 and he was 50. In her statement, she said he forced himself on her in much the same way he had done to Samantha. She hadn't come forward before because she realized that talking about the abuse would lead her to being exiled in Hollywood and at the time, she wanted to be an actress. But after giving birth to her son in 2003, and leaving acting behind, when Roman was arrested in 2009, she felt it was finally her time to come forward. She hoped that she would be believed, as he himself stated, that he had a proclivity towards young girls, but Harvey Weinstein championed Roman, and stated that Charlotte was looking for her 15 minutes of fame after her career had failed. Seven years following Charlotte's claims, Another actress, Renate Langer, told Swiss police that Polanski had assaulted her when she was 15. She had been introduced to Roman when she began to work as a model in Munich, while in high school. He had taken an interest in her, and with the promise of wanting to cast her in his next movie, he flew her from Munich to Gestad on her own. It was on this trip that Polanski raped her in the bathroom of his home. She, like Sam and Charlotte, had tried to fight him off and made it clear that she didn't want to have sex with him, but he continued. After the assault, Renate flew home, unsure of what to do. She thought her parents would be devastated and upset, so she kept the assault to herself. A month after, he called her and apologized for what he had done. He then offered her a role in the movie The Venus Flytrap which she accepted. She felt protected on the set and had been given accommodations with other castmates. She made sure she was never left alone with Roman. However, as the director, he had a considerable amount of power and was able to orchestrate being left alone with her once more, this time in the large house in Rome. Again, Renate tried to fight Roman off, throwing a bottle of wine and perfume at him, but he didn't stop. 
The same month that Renate came forward, a Californian artist by the name of Marianne Bernard stated that she had also been assaulted by him when she was just 10 years old. The assault took place in 1975, and much like what happened with Sam, Marianne stated that Roman had approached her mother with the intent to photograph her at the beach. After some time, her mother had left Marianne alone with Roman, who told her that he needed her to pose naked for some of the photos. Being that she was only 10 and had no idea what was going on, she did so, and he molested her. The latest allegation against Polanski was made in 2019, when French actress Valentine Monnier came forward and stated that in 1975, the same year he had assaulted Bernard, he had likewise raped her in Gestad. Multiple third-party witnesses confirmed this story, stating they saw the aftermath and that after this occurred, Valentine spoke to them about it. To this day, Polanski has not been brought to justice and, in fact, is incredibly blasé about his crimes. He speaks of them as if they were nothing and as if he was the one truly victimized by every girl he had slept with. While Samantha has forgiven him, and celebrities like Whoopi Goldberg state that what he did wasn't really rape, he has left a veritable disaster everywhere he has gone, hurting the people closest to him relentlessly, without care. It should also be said that any time Roman talked about sleeping with underage girls and having sex with them, he is unequivocally talking about assault, as none of those girls could consent. It doesn't matter if they were flirting with him, he is an adult taking advantage of children, and no matter how you dress that up, it's illegal. Thank you for watching this episode of Dreading. If you like this video, hit the like button and consider subscribing. If you want to see more content from us, feel free to give us a case suggestion in the comments below. And remember, stay safe.